Good evening, all, and welcome. Tonight, we're going to be venturing into the world of the paranormal. Tonight's video is in fact a collaboration with fellow YouTube creator Undead Storyteller, who has a narration channel of her own where she narrates scary stories, similar to what I do. Now, 10 stories are featuring in this video, and there are 10 more narrated by each of us over on her channel to complement your listening tonight. So be sure to check it out when you're done here. The link, of course, in the description and will be shown on screen at the end. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. This takes place 12 years ago. I was 12 years old, and my gifts were starting to happen. My uncle and cousin had stopped by to stay for the weekend. It was a Friday. The day was normal, nothing strange about it. My cousin and I just hang out for the day. My cousin and I had to share a room, and her bed was against one wall, and mine was located at the wall on the other end of the room. Hers was by the door, and mine was against a wall at the other end of the room. That night, we both went to sleep as normal. As I was sleeping, I felt someone staring at me, so I woke up. I pulled the covers off me and sat up. Standing at the end of my bed was a little girl around seven or eight years old. Just a reminder, my cousin and I were 12 going on 13. She had blonde hair, blue eyes, and was wearing this bright, heavenly looking dress. She was looking at my cousin at first, who was still sleeping in her bed, snoring. Then she turned to me, smiled. It was a huge, happy smile, beautiful white teeth with no stains. She reached out her hand, and at this point, I stood up and ran out the room, yelling for my grandmother. Nana, there's a strange little girl in my room. My Nana gets up and comes with me to the room. She was gone. My cousin was still snoring in her bed, so my Nana said to me, Matthew, you probably had a dream. I then explained, No, Nana, I was wide awake. She even reached out to me. She then said, Don't you think about it anymore, honey. Just go back to sleep and forget it ever happened. So I did. For years I lived, thinking it may have just been a dream. Fast forward five years. I was 17. I was told that the landlord who owned the house had lived there with his daughters. One daughter was a twin, and they had passed away when they were about seven years old in the house. The house is located next to a highway, and one day the twin was playing outside with a ball that bounced into the road. As she went after it, someone had decided to start speeding around the corner, and sadly, hit the twin as she went out to get the ball. I still didn't think much more of my experience as more than a dream until one day. I went to the landlord's house to walk his dog back there, like I had hundreds of times. But this time, he let me into his house and look around his antiques, as I have this strange obsession with antiques. I was looking at his family photos when one caught my eye. The picture was of the twins, taken just months before the twin had been killed. It was the little girl I had seen five years prior. Blonde hair, blue eyes, same big smile. At that point, I connected the pieces and have come to terms with my sighting. I saw her. I saw the little girl. She appeared to me and I don't know why. Now, I need to add some minor details here. My cousin and I both have brown hair. I have hazel eyes. She has brown eyes. And one day, soon after my visitation, I was going after something in the same road. And as I did, I heard a little girl yell my name and I was the only one home. So I turned around and replied before stepping into the road. And as I did, a speeding car went by, and it would have hit me had I stepped out. The next experience I had was when I was 10. I moved into my grandmother's house. Some family problems were going on, and it was decided that I would go live with them. Nothing out of the ordinary my first year there, but that soon changed. My first experience with something strange happened when I was 11. It was a regular night, nothing out of the ordinary. 
I was sitting down at the table with my Nana, playing checkers and having a good chat. Suddenly, we heard someone running through the hallway. My Nana did not seem to react at all, so I decided to get up and investigate. She told me to leave it be, but I was a kid and full of curiosity. It was dark, no lights on, and I did not think to turn any on. As I approached the hallway, I heard the footsteps stop. Then they suddenly started to run towards me, not at an extremely quick pace, so fast I couldn't react. Just as they reached me, they stopped, and no one was there. I walked away scared and unsure of what I experienced. As I was walking away, I turned to look back, and that's when I saw a bright light flash, followed by a large orb appearing. It zoomed back into the hallway and vanished. I never told my Nana out of fear of not being believed. My next experience happened a few weeks later. I was playing outside alone. My back started to burn an itch, so I went inside and asked my Nana to look at my back. She suddenly asks me, what did you do to your back? I told her I hadn't done anything. I'd not laid on my back or put my back against anything. It just started burning. My back was covered in scratches all over about 13 in total, and they looked like nails had scratched me. The next experiences happened over a period of time. The first one is of multiple experiences that happened on a night like any other. It was just my Nana and I living in the house. It was about nine at night, when we suddenly heard people working and talking in the basement. Loud bangs, the sounds of shovels digging up the floor, and the sounds of the floor being hit by something suddenly filled the house. I got scared and asked my Nana about it, and she told me it was the ghosts working in the basement. I got the courage to look. I turned the light on and opened the door, fully expecting to see someone standing there. There was nothing. No one. The sound stopped completely, and I decided to go down and look. Nothing was touched. Nothing was moved. And no one was down there. As I went to shut the door, I heard someone yell to me, let us work in peace. I quickly shut the door and walked away. Then the sound started up again. Fast forward two years later, and in the middle of the day, it started again. Same thing. No one was there. Fast forward four years from there, my Nana passed away, and my mum and I moved into the house. I had a friend over and we were in the living room directly above the basement when suddenly the sound started up again. The floors started to shake and the loud bangs and talking could be heard throughout the entire house. My mum comes in and asks what the sounds are and without skipping a beat, I tell her to let the spirits work in peace and to leave them alone. This last one is my final experience. This next story takes place over a period of eight years. Some backstory. The first part of this house was constructed in the 1850s and was a farmhouse. The next part of the house was constructed in the 1980s, when the landlord I knew who owned it decided to add it on for his wife who had fallen in love with the house. So because of this, the house had two attics. One required a rung ladder to climb into and had no floor, just a series of boards about six feet apart from each other, and was mainly used as an insulation attic. The other was your usual attic, with stairs that led into two big rooms. Well, the attic with stairs we'll call Attic 1, and the one without stairs and a floor we will call Attic 2. Whenever I was told I had to go into Attic 1, I always had a bad feeling, and dread overtook me every time I went. I found myself struggling to go into the attic because of these feelings. Well, every time I'd go in there, I'd hear someone breathing from whichever room would be opposite from me. Regardless of the day or time, it would always scare me. Goosebumps, cold chills, and the breathing would always happen every time I went into the attic, which made it rather difficult to have to go there from time to time. One day, I was asked by my Nana to go up and look for something. She told me exactly where it would be. It was in room two in a box, up on the furthest corner to the right. 
so essentially the deepest you could get into the attic. I said okay, even though fear immediately struck me. I was not a scared child. Fear was not a part of me until I moved into this house. So I opened the attic door and thought I heard someone take a step at the top of the attic, like someone had just finished walking up the stairs. So I paused for a moment, took a deep breath and proceeded to start up the stairs. As I was going up, I could hear whoever walking towards where I would be going, which terrified me, but I proceeded anyway. When I got to the top of the stairs, a shadow quickly went by the doorway I would be walking into. So I looked to my left and lying on a pile of boxes was an old baseball bat. So I grabbed it, at least to help me relieve my slight fear. As I started creeping towards the doorway, I could hear breathing coming from the room I was in. As I stepped into the room, it stopped. No one and nothing was there. But I knew I had seen and heard someone up there. It's impossible to hide in this attic, because it had no real corners or any place someone could successfully hide in. So I continued to the corner to grab the item. And after some digging, I found it. So I quickly walked back to the top of the stairs. And as I started down them, I decided to look back towards the room I was in and saw a shadow standing there. I jumped down the rest of the stairs, shut and locked the door quickly and gave my Nana the item she had asked for. She asked me what happened. And all I could say was nothing. Now I'm going to make the rest of Attic One's experiences quick because all of them were like that. Every single time I would go into that attic over the next few years, I'd hear the heavy breathing, watching things move completely by themselves with no possible way for it to happen and occasionally see more shadows moving by themselves. We would occasionally hear someone walking up there, but never chose to investigate it because we already knew what it was. Now on to Attic 2. This attic, there are no words to describe this attic. When I asked my Nana about this attic one day, she told me to never open the door. Upon asking why, all she said was, Matthew, there's something evil up there. Something so dark and angry, it should never be released. So I said, okay, and never asked about it again, because I could see the terror in her eyes, and nothing ever scared her. One morning as I awoke from a heavy sleep, and started to get onto my PlayStation 2, I heard someone walking up there. Four extremely heavy footsteps, which would be impossible because there was no floor to walk on, and with the force of these steps, the boards would have not have been able to support it. So I decided to wake my Nana and tell her about it, but they had stopped by the time she awoke. So she went back to sleep. This took place when I was 12. A short time later, I was outside throwing a ball against the side of the house where the window to that attic was located. I threw too high and ended up breaking the window. So my grandfather had to get a new window and go up there to fix it. My Nana was furious because she never wanted that attic door to be opened. This is where the activity in the house started to ramp up. A few years later, I was 14 and started to act rebellious against the ghosts in the house, and started to say and do whatever I could to get them going. Like an idiot, I'll admit it. But I did not know any better. My bedroom door was located almost just underneath the doorway to Attic 2, and one night I decided to do my best to get them going. So I said, If you were truly real, you wouldn't be scared to make yourselves known. Big mistake. A moment later, I saw a shadow standing outside my doorway, underneath the attic two door. And then I heard it say in a loud, old and stern voice, No. And it quickly disappeared. Now, listeners, there is still one more part to go in my time in Hell House. But I'm gonna leave this one on a lighter note. As I grew up in the house, I would at random times smell the strong scent of either cinnamon or roses. I would always go tell my Nana when it happened, and it would never be in the same part of the house, and it was never at a certain time. 
It was always and completely random. When I asked my Nana about it, she told me that our landlord's ex-wife who passed away in the house loved the smell of cinnamon and roses. She also told me that when I smelt one, that it was either her warning that either something good or bad was gonna happen. When we smelt cinnamon randomly without any sauce, something bad was gonna happen and vice versa. As an example, one day my cousin who I mentioned in the story about the little girl smelt cinnamon at the top of the stairs one day. She went outside to play that day like any other, but after a while she ran into the house screaming. At one point she had fallen and landed on a corn plant stump and part of it had gone up her nose. She was quickly taken to hospital. One time when I was 12, I'd smelt cinnamon strongly in the doll room and later on that night, I had fallen on a trash bag after getting scared by my mum's ex-husband and sliced my foot wide open from something sharp in the bag. Another time after my grandmother had passed, I smelt roses in one of the rooms and later on that day, I got a promotion and raise at work. That isn't all that she would do though. Before the doll room had become such, it was just another living room with a TV and was where my Nana would sit and watch TV and rest but every so often out of the corner of her eye, she would see a full body silhouette that was pure white quickly dash from the beginning of the room into the hallway. And it scared my Nana so much that she turned that room into the doll room where she stored all her dolls and moved her living room stuff to another part of the house. One day, when I was sitting in the doll room looking and studying all the antiques and other collectibles, I too saw this white silhouette dash from the beginning of the room to the hallway. After that, I did everything I could to avoid going into that room again. I hope you enjoyed the stories. Every bit of them is true, and it made my life growing up hard, because I always felt like I was being watched in that house. My family has moved around a lot because my dad has a ton of health problems. And he was our primary source of income before he had his first heart attack. Thus, we lived in a lot of shady places when I was a kid. Eventually, my mom got a good paying job and we bought a trailer on some land my mom's side of the family gave to us. This land is adjacent to a very old cemetery and a church. We moved into this trailer when my sister was about one and a half, and I was around six or seven. This trailer was horribly small and run down, but besides that, it was livable, and we were excited to have a better place than our previous one. All was normal, until one day when my sister, who again was barely able to say any words at all, began waving at someone outside of our screen door. She would become very excited and animated, laughing and smiling, waving ecstatically. Confused, my mom asked her who was out there, assuming it had to be our grandmother or our aunt, who she had a particular fondness for. My sister only shook her head. When we looked outside, no one was there. Not even a dog or any other animal. This happened often. As she got older, other aspects of these imaginary friends began to develop. They had names, which I will talk about in a moment, and she became increasingly convinced that they were real. I remember her sitting her stuffed animals in a circle on our kitchen floor and leaving two empty places for her friends, who she even began calling her ghost friends. One time, my cousin and I tried to sit in these places, and my sister lost it, beginning to sob and yell at us, insisting we could not sit on her friends. The names she came up with were Dukan, Juby, and later on, Savies. These names always made little sense to us, until I began recently thinking of them through a child's mind. She was likely mispronouncing more common names, Duncan, Judy, and Celeste. During this time, my dad looked through the headstones in the cemetery near our house, but most of them were so old that the names were completely rubbed away. 
Later on, I looked multiple times and came up empty on all of these names. Oddly enough, there are quite a few infant and child headstones in the graveyard, though. Also during this time, our family experienced a lot of strange moments in that trailer. We could hear water running in the middle of the night, and we could even recognize the sound of the water hitting the aluminum of the kitchen sink, but it would fade away when we got up to look. My sister's dolls would disappear and reappear in new locations, and inexplicable thumps would echo through the house. After several years of this, we began construction on a house on the land that we had been given. When it was completed, we sold the trailer and moved into the house. My sister would have been around eight then. After just a week or so in this new house, her friends vanished. We never heard from them again and she swears up and down that she doesn't remember any of those experiences. She always gets freaked out when we bring them up. The end of her friends did not mark the end of our experiences, however. If anything, it marked an increase in it. There were so many different things it's hard to remember them all, but here are a few of the highlights. 1. One winter day, we all heard an incredibly loud thump echo through the house. We all heard it in the same area, but could find no reason that such a sound would have been made. 2. My parents heard someone run through our hallway. The lights flipped on, and my dog began growling. They assumed one of us was sick and running to the bathroom, but my sister and I were fast asleep. 3. My cousin saw someone in my room as she drove by my house, and assumed that I was home alone. She called me, but I was out with friends, and no one else was home either. I also always have my blinds closed. She described the figure as tall and dark. The features could not be made out. Later on, before hearing this story, my sister was taking a bath when home alone. My room is across the hallway from the bathroom, and she said she saw a tall figure standing in my doorway. The only thing she could make out were its eyes. To this day, she closes my room door before going to the bathroom. 4. I'm a writer, and thus I stay up late writing fairly frequently. One night, I was writing a piece, and needed to review one of the books I was using for a reference. This was around 2.30 a.m. I retrieved it from my bookshelf, and went back to the room where I write. A little after 3 a.m., I took the reference book back, and was stopped dead in my tracks. Our basement door was standing wide open, literally as far as it could go. I panicked and woke my dad up, assuming someone was in the house. We both knew there was no way that it had just been jarred open, because my mom religiously ensures that it's locked. We were robbed many years earlier, and it's a constant fear for her. My dad and I grabbed guns and began searching the house. We never found anything. The alarm system was still activated, and all the doors to the outside were bolted. 5. Once I was using the bathroom late at night and reading a book. It was probably around midnight. All of a sudden, I heard tapping on the door. It was fairly rapid and came in bursts of three. My first thought was that it was my dog scratching, but as I listened, it was much too high up for that. He's a small dog, and this was occurring near the middle of the door probably two or three feet off of the floor. Next, I assumed it was my sister playing a prank, but as I listened, I could hear her talking to my dad in the living room. This was in summer, and my family stays up pretty late. My mom works the night shift, and she stays up late when she's home, so we're all just accustomed to the nightlife. Once I realized this, my imagination started wandering, and I grew more than a little afraid. I yelled for my dad to come to the bathroom, and the panic in my voice made him run. The sound stopped as soon as his feet hit the floor. I've never heard it again. 6. 
I too experienced the hallway lights flipping on late at night. I was probably around 12 or 13 at the time, and it was Christmas. I was a sheltered child, and an imaginative one too. And until this point, I still wanted to believe in Santa despite everyone telling me it was fake. So late one night, I heard noises in the living room, just rustling and things like that, and I grew excited. I snuggled down under my blankets with only my eyes peeking out. Then I saw the hallway lights come on, but there were never any footsteps or other noises. There was just silence. Eventually, I got up and turned them off, curious. I checked and made sure everyone was asleep, and they were. Side note. Presents were under the tree. 7. This final experience happened to my cousin and my sister. We hadn't been moved into that new house for long when it occurred. The two were in our basement, playing with my sister's dolls. They had a tea party set up and were waiting on me to wake up. I had stayed up late and slept past noon that day. Eventually, they heard footsteps on the stairs. Our stairs were segmented, with one flight going down to a landing and then another longer flight leading down to the basement. It's impossible to see around that bend between segments, and thus it was a popular way of playing scary pranks on each other. The footsteps stopped on that first flight, and naturally it was assumed that I was playing a prank. My cousin called up to me, but I didn't reply. This went on for a while until the pair decided enough was enough. They went up the stairs, and nothing was there. Confused, they found my mom and asked if I had been through the house to the basement. She said no. They checked, and I was still fast asleep. Freaked out, but needing to pick up the mess they'd made, they went back downstairs again to see that all of their teapots and cups had been spilled. Water was everywhere. They fled upstairs after that. I was 13 years old. We lived in Lowell, Indiana. Our house was built in the 1800s, antebellum style and huge. It always creeped me out. From the very day we moved in, I was aware that we weren't alone in that house. The house itself had seven bedrooms. I had three sisters and one brother, although we had plenty of rooms to have our own. We paired up. I shared a room with my older sister, and my younger twin sisters had their room together. I will now share with you two of the most frightening experiences I had when I lived there. The first one before we decided that we would rather have a roommate than be alone. It was around the first month or so of us living there. I had trouble falling asleep to begin with, and it was summer, but I remember it being extremely cold in my room. So cold, that I shivered and rolled onto my side to curl up under my blankets. Finally, I fell asleep, but I awoke and my skin was ice cold. My blanket was missing. I didn't think much of it, so I looked over to the right side of my bed on the floor, then to my left. Nothing. The hair stood up on the back of my neck as I crawled to the foot of my bed and saw my blanket laying perfectly flat, like someone had taken it off me in the middle of the night and laid it out on the floor. Absolutely no wrinkles in it. I actually don't recall how I reacted. I just know that it creeped me out so much that I moved into my big sister's room on the second floor that very night. The second incident that really stood out and still does confuse me was we had a horseshoe driveway and a security light in our front yard. During the summers, we always kept our windows up as it stayed cool enough due to the light breeze and fresh air. One night, really late, the doorbell, which was extremely loud, rang. I got up and looked out the window down to my aunt Kathy, who was standing there with my cousins, Steve and Jessica. I could see them from their headlights, and it was pouring rain like a monsoon, which I also saw thanks to the headlights. I yelled down, Hey, you guys okay? Yeah, can you let us in? She replied. 
Me and Keith are fighting again. Yeah, let me wake up my mum, I reply. So I wake her up, and she firmly says, as a matter of factly, well, let them in. I ran around the banister down the 27 stairs to the foyer and opened the door. There was no one there. No car, no rain, nothing. Just a warm breeze and the scaredest I've ever been in my entire life. I'm not sure if any of you know about these things, but can anyone explain what happened to me? I'm not the only one who witnessed it. My sister and my mum were both awake, and my sister was looking out the window as well as me. I always wondered what it was I let into my house. Like what was it that rang the doorbell pretending to be a loved one in trouble? It's like whatever it was knew that we'd open the door if someone we loved was in trouble. Insidious is how it felt. At the time, when I looked down from the second story window at my aunt, Kathy, cousin Stevie, and Kathy holding baby Jessica on her hips, Jessica wasn't born yet. But this is what shakes me too. I told my mum, Aunt Kathy, Stevie, and baby Jessica are here. At the time, Kathy was only three months pregnant. So there's this woman down in Mexico who I saw a few weeks back, who maybe triggered me a little, and now I'm questioning everything. Who to trust, what to think of people in general, if the spirit world is a thing. I need some outside opinions on this. This, I thought, was a brilliant idea to share with one of my good client friends. I'm a hairstylist. I wanted to see what they thought of my experience, and now I'm going to maybe meet with this woman once again, per my friend's advice. I'm currently sitting in a patio bar with a Mexican martini to my left as I type this. It's 46 degrees in February, but here I am. I felt the urge of writing this down because I need to remember every detail before my forgetful brain lets this experience fade away like the black dye on my jeans every time I wash them. So this all started last month. I was feeling like crap. I was anxious, stressed, sad, mad, exhausted. Like if everything I was doing was for absolutely no use. Just awful. I've had this weird migraine for like a week now. I took meds and nothing worked. I was on my way down to Mexico with my mom to visit family and just to go see my dermatologist and physical therapist down there. I go once a month to see my grandmother and to get my pits roasted by a laser and stock up on junk food. Try to picture me in the passenger seat, crying to my mom, telling her about how bad that I feel and that I'm thinking about seeing a therapist because the anxiety has gotten kind of out of hand. I can be a little dramatic sometimes, but most of the time, I'm pretty chill. My mom is more of a traditional Mexican Catholic kind of mother. She abides by her upbringing and is pretty much set in her ways. I want to make it clear that she is a loving, caring, and mellow soul. She goes to Mass every Sunday and even during the week. She believes in spirits, good, evil, and all of those things. This woman is kind of against medication. She says it's best for last resort. I agree. Anyway, I'm crying to her telling her my thoughts and she suggests maybe trying one last thing before deciding on medication. I will say, I'm in no rush for medication. I think work and my side projects had me going a little nuts. I tend to give myself too much to do at times, then crunch time here and there, and I'm a mess. My mom suggests that I speak to her cousin. I've never met this specific cousin. I ask her what cousin's deal is, and she tells me that she is a medium, a healing medium, and that maybe she can help me out before I go western. Mom tells me that at a very young age, her cousin was told by a woman that she would be a healer. Her cousin was scared, and she refused to be involved. She thought it was crazy and thought it was witchcraft, so she always said no. 
I'm not entirely sure how she got into the world of spirits, but it happened. She is now a medium for particular spirits that take over her body and use her as a tool for healing the sick. The trip to Mexico was done in three days. It's crazy, but I drove down there for eight hours, stayed one whole day, and then came back home the following day. Day one, I arrive in Mexico late at night and go to bed. Day two, I wake up and I hang out with my grandmother the whole day. She shares the latest gossip about all my cousins. We eat all of Mexico and then head back home. It's late in the evening again, like nine-ish. My mom comes up to me and asks me if I want to visit her cousin. I swear, I kind of went a little pale. She tells me she can't go with me because she needs to stay home with her mom. She told me to go pick up her sister and have her go with me. At this point, I'm like, no, it's late. I'll be disturbing my aunt this late and my mom's cousin too. But mom said her cousin is a very busy lady and that if I wanted to talk to her, this would be the best time. I asked her to please go with me, but she insisted that I go with my aunt. So I pick up my aunt. She lives just on the other side of the boulevard, and she was up late because she was working on some tax things for one of her clients. She said she needed a break, and she mentioned she was hoping she would talk to Margarita too. My mom's cousin is not Margarita. This is a spirit. I'm thinking to myself, just like that though? Like you just want to have a convo with a spirit at 10 ish at night? Normal routine down here? This is fine. Mom said it's fine. We pull up to her cousin's house. It's a small place. It's very dark out. My aunt knocks and kind of lets herself in and loudly says her cousin's name. And all I notice are the low ceilings. I'm a tall gal. The lights are very dim. I see this friendly face come up to us and say welcome. I've never met this woman before. She leads us into a small room next to her living area. This room has an interesting aroma. It's different. It's floral or herbal, but with a hint of burning candle. The walls are a bright yellow color with candle smoke stains in different areas. The room is full of saint statues and a lot of framed pictures on the wall. I'm going to refer to my mom's cousin as the cousin. She says hi, that she got a call from my aunt that I was hoping to see her. I guess mom called her sister and my mom's sister called the cousin. Word travels fast. All I was thinking was that I wanted to speak to Margarita and see what this was all about. The three of us are in the room and the door is now closed. The cousin turns toward an altar in the room with her eyes closed and she begins a long prayer. She calls the name Margarita de Catalan three times, and from this point, it all went weird. The cousin turns toward me with her eyes closed and holds her hands midair, doing a slight wrist turn in a sassy kind of way. This wasn't the cousin. This was Margarita. She says hi, and that she will help me, but she needs to do something first. The first thing I notice is a different voice and a Spanish lisp, which was not there when the cousin greeted us. Her eyes are still closed. She walks over to my aunt, and my aunt hands her a large, very flowy skirt. She puts it on. She then walks over to me again. She tells me that she likes wearing long skirts because it allows her to not wear underwear. I laughed. She asks me what's going on. I tell her that I've been dealing with these constant migraines, that I feel like my body is sort of letting me down physically, and that it's taking a toll on my emotional state. She tells me, it's all the mirrors that you're around, and all the people that you touch. I'm like, wait, what? How does she know this? This is true. Mirrors and people are my everyday life. She tells me it's my energy that people seek me for, and when they're with me and I make contact with them, it drains me and I take in the heavy stuff from them. She tells me that's where the tiredness comes from. 
She looks over at my aunt and tells her, They gave me this one ojo. I need to do a cleanse. My aunt looks at me like she's saying, You're good, don't worry. Margarita starts a prayer. Her eyes are closed this whole time. She hasn't peeped once. She is walking freely around the room as if her eyes were open, but they're not. She grabs a plant, which she tells me is called Perul, and she pours this tonic that smells delicate. It's a mixture of herbs that she has in a glass jug. She smacks it against her hand to get rid of the excess, and she begins. She sang some traditional Catholic prayers that I recognized from my mom practicing. She started at my feet, brushing the perul side to side. Then she worked her way up to my abdomen, praying, and then she traveled up to my head. I was bowing down to not get hit in the face, but I decided to just go with it. I wanted to have faith that whatever this was, was good. She turned me, worked from my head down to my feet. After the lengthy prayer, she threw the perul on the floor and told me to stomp on it. So I did. She picked it up and asked my aunt for the bag that was behind her, and she put the plants in there and said that she would burn them later. I had heard from childhood of this ritual, but had never actually experienced it. At this point, I'm just taking it all in. I'm like, well, what did I lose just by standing here and hoping that the migraines go away, right? Because people do this all the time, right? Did I mention that her eyes were closed this whole time? Margarita made it clear that having Ojo is dangerous and that it needs to be dealt with fast. She calls a girl that lives in the medium's house that was just outside the room to come in and to bring her an egg, a room temp egg. She's back within a minute. The egg is used to absorb bad energy from Ojo, the evil eye. She begins another prayer, egg in hand, and the other holding to my arm. She prays close to my eyes, and then wipes the egg in small cross motions, starting at my head, next to my eyes, working her way down my neck, then my chest, heart, abdomen, and does one smooth swipe to one of my legs, and then the other. She comes back to my head to finish the prayer and keeps doing many small cross motions all around. She has a glass filled with water at the altar. She cracks the egg into the glass. She pulls my aunt and starts showing her something on the egg. I kind of bust into their conversation and ask to see. She shows us both that the whites are practically cooked. The whites were white, not clear. My head is a frying pan. The egg was soft and stringy, but white. She said that I had Ojo. She told me that a very tall, dark man that I run into frequently gave me the Ojo. I could only think of one man. There's this dude at the gym that gives me a really heavy stare, and it's honestly kind of disturbing. It's made me want to start avoiding running into him because it never fails. He always gives me a weird look. I'm not sure if at this point I was trying to make a connection with the whole experience, but I'm also not sure of how much of a coincidence it would be that I could pinpoint someone that fast. She told me to come back tomorrow before going on to my destination, but to tell the medium right before leaving tonight. She asked me why I was going to see the White Ones tomorrow. She meant the doctors. Again, how did she know that I was going to see a physical therapist, and maybe about lasering my pits? I told her that I'd been getting therapy for one of my legs. I've been dealing with sciatic pain for a while now, and the therapy seemed to help, so I was back for another session. She told me to pull my pants down so that she could massage another tonic on it. I pull my pants down and she laughs and says, she wear those things, I don't. She was referring to underwear. She massaged my leg with her eyes closed, and she said that it should help. Margarita mentioned a few things that were now sitting in the back of my head. I was told that there was a woman at work who wondered a lot about me, but couldn't tell if she meant harm or not, or if this woman was just truly curious. 
She also mentioned that I was going to make excuses to avoid going on a big trip. To tell someone close to me to remind me that they were just excuses, and that I need to go regardless of what I say. I told her I was planning a trip with the family in May, and that I was really looking forward to it. She replied that I needed to go, and that I should say a prayer before boarding because I was in charge of a very large group. Margarita gave me advice on how to deal with energy. She told me to wear a red bracelet or to keep an aluminum stone at my workplace to let it absorb the overload and to get rid of it after some time, but to not make direct contact with it. She told me to brush off my arms after finishing work and before making my way home. She advises me to brush my arms off again when taking a shower, but to aim it towards the drain to make sure that the bad stuff wouldn't linger around the house. She asked me to bring a couple of bottles because she wanted me to take some tonics home. She also mentioned something about a man, who I would find interesting soon. My aunt asked for a quick cleanse. She was working late on an audit and had a presentation in front of a board and had just asked for clear mindfulness and to give her strength throughout the process. She did the whole Peru cleanse. I had lost track of time. It was almost one in the morning. Margarita asks if there's anything else she can assist us with. We both replied no, and I said thank you for seeing me. She turned to the altar and began another prayer. She put her palms together and then brought out one of her hands to a wafting motion towards her forehead, as if she was welcoming something into the body from in front of her. She took a couple of deep breaths, and my aunt reached over to Margarita because she sort of lost her balance. She pulled the chair over to her and said, That one was heavy. It was the cousin. She was back. She felt weak and seemed a little drained. Her eyes were kind of red. My aunt explained to me that the cousin has no recollection of what happens when she is in trance. Therefore, you might have to explain to her if you're coming back or if the spirit needs her to do anything. I told her that Margarita asked me to come back tomorrow, around one-ish after my doctor's appointments. She said okay, that she would see us then. I get in the car, and my aunt drives back to her place. Along the way, she tells me that Ojo is very dangerous, life-threatening. She says that even if someone doesn't mean to do you harm, that with any amount of jealousy or even deep interest, can be the cause of the evil eye. It's an accumulation of energy, and your body doesn't know what to do with it, so it stores it, and you start having symptoms of the overload. The deadly part is that the headaches can cause damage. We pull up to her house, and I take over the driver's seat. My aunt makes her way inside. I'm just trying to get home. But the drive was hard, and I was trying to wrap my head around it. I'm a skeptical person, but I like to think of myself as a spiritual person, not religious. I don't know where this falls, if this is black magic, white magic. Is there such a thing as gray? I'm kind of freaked out, because if in fact I spoke to a spirit, then oh my god. Then the skepticism kicked in and I started wondering if mom had said too much about my aunt before my visit. I needed answers. I get home. Mom and my grandmother are both asleep, and I go straight to Google under the sheets. I started looking up Margarita's name, but didn't find much info on her. But there is a wiki page about a woman who was accused of being a witch. With that name. Her last name was Templet on the wiki page. I went to bed thinking, great, what door did I just open? The first real paranormal experience I had was when I was 24 years old, and the year was 2002. My husband and I were living in a rental house that we moved into in late October of 2001. The house always gave me that weird feeling that I was being watched. I was working a part-time job four hours a day, Monday through Friday, and I would get off work around 1.30pm. 
My husband worked a full-time position with his hours all over the place. You could say that I was home alone a lot. We had a German Shepherd chocolate Labrador mix named Bear Claw. He was a smart dog and very happy and always by my husband or my side. Let me explain the layout of the house before I continue with the story. When you walk into the living room, there was a bedroom off to the left. Straight ahead is the dining room. The second bedroom is also to the left in the dining room. And we had a Jack and Jill bathroom between the two bedrooms. Off the dining room is the kitchen and through the kitchen was a family room with a sliding door and to the backyard and a half bath. The whole house was a hardwood floor with a crawl space underneath the house. There were no carpets in the house except for the family room. So you had to walk across the floor and you can hear footsteps and the floor would creak because it's uneven. Bearclaw loved being outside, but when he was in the house, he would never leave the family room. Bearclaw would stand at the doorway watching me in the living room and cry when I was alone in the house, but he wouldn't cry when my husband was there. I had a hard time walking through the kitchen. The air was heavy in there and my skin would crawl. It got to the point that when my husband left for work, I would walk to my mother's and father's house, which was three blocks away. Skipping to March 2002. It was late. My husband and I were asleep in a full size bed. It was small and cramped, but my husband and I loved to cuddle. So we were okay with it. It's also essential to know that we had no bed frame. So the box spring and mattress sat on the floor. We had a duck lamp that gave off a strange orange glow that I used for a nightlight because I've always been afraid of the dark. It was a hot night and I could not sleep because of the heat. I would take my blanket off too to cool down, but then it got too cold. So I covered it back up. It was too hot to cuddle. My husband and I were both lying on our backs, shoulder to shoulder, him fast asleep, which I found odd as my husband does not take heat well. I finally got to the point that I just stuck my left foot out and handed over the covers and hung them on both ends of the bed. My body temperature was just starting to stabilize and I felt I could finally go to sleep. I closed my eyes and as I do, I hear someone step into the room with a loud creak sound. My heart jumped to my throat. I tried to open my eyes to see who came into the room and to my surprise, I couldn't open them. I didn't understand what was going on. Just then, I felt a large skinny cold hand grabbed my ankle and then my wrist. I went to yell for my husband, but I could only scream in my head. My heart was beating faster and I was being pulled off the bed. I then went to grab my left wrist and whoever had a hold of it, but I couldn't move my arm. I kept trying to call for my husband and trying to move my right hand. And finally, my right hand moved and grabbed my left wrist. But there was no one grabbing me. Then my eyes pop open and there was no one there. And I was partially off the bed. I crawled back onto the bed and under the covers. I got so close to my husband that I'm nearly laying on him, but I was so scared I didn't go to sleep till the next morning sun shined through the bedroom windows. When I finally got up next day, I told my husband what happened to me. He said that he thought he felt me being pulled away slowly, like from him, like I was being dragged. Then he felt me put my arm around him. In the following weeks, I found a thing called sleep paralysis. You know, that frightening state that a person finds themselves in when they're unable to move. It's due to an irregularity in passing between sleep stages and wakefulness. I then asked him how this could be sleep paralysis. If I found myself partially pulled off the bed, I could still feel the hands around my wrists and ankles the following next few days. He pulled out a book about supernatural creatures and read me one about a beast called the night hag or the old hag. A short explanation is a supernatural creature that's used to explain sleep paralysis. The phenomenon happens to a sleeping person who's on their back. The person feels a presence and the person can't move and then they feel the person sitting on their chest and they can't breathe or they feel the creature sit on the foot of the bed. I don't know if that was it, but I know that it wasn't sleep paralysis. Since that day, I've seen and heard things that others can't. 
A few weeks after that night, I found out I was pregnant with our first child. I thought just maybe whatever it was, wanted my unborn baby. To this day, when I think about that night, I can still feel two large, thin, cold hands on my wrists and ankles, like it's a mark that was given to me that opens the doors to the supernatural. I just wish I could give it back. My whole life, I have felt an entity with me. I don't know what it is, but I have had occurrences happen that possibly involve it. 1. When I was young, maybe 4 or 5, we, me and my mother, were staying at my auntie's place that she had just moved into. It was a log cabin. Here in Australia, that's a rare find. It had two stories, and we stayed on the top floor. Where exactly is hazy, as I only remember smidges of information. I don't remember this happening, but when my mother told me about it eventually, it stayed with me forever. And it's simple, so it can't be added onto or falsified. Basically, my mom needed to go use the bathroom. She went to the toilet and came back. I was laying on a mattress on the floor. She opened the door to see a large, black figure, with no definable shape, and no, it wasn't the wide-brimmed shadow man before anyone asks. She looked at it for apparently what felt like hours, but I think it was exaggerated. She then continued to say that it broke its motionless stare to point at me. She then looked down at me, and then looked back to see that it had vanished. And that's it. She went back to bed and didn't sleep. Two, I'm not going to involve religion or invoke any kind of argument, but what I will say is that there is an energy in everything and we are capable of feeling it, e.g. gut feelings or when you know someone is watching you. Not all day long, but when I'm calm and not really focused on a task, I can feel its presence near me. It's like the feeling when you know someone is behind you that you feel the space between you tighten. Like that, but less physical. 3. Many times I have been very, very close to immediate death. One example is when I was younger, maybe two or three. We lived in the outback, isolated staying with my grandfather at the time, apparently, as I don't remember this. I walked off into the very early morning down the street, just after sunrise, only to be returned by some random woman in her twenties. This happened again a few months later, while living in a mid-city area in the late hours of night. I left home again to walk a still very busy main road, only again to be returned by an old woman, with a walker, at 1 a.m. or later? No one questioned it at first, but after a couple things happened, of late I'm fishing through everything I've been through, and none of it makes any sense. 4. This is why I started to question everything. I met a Wiccan, and almost a month in, she said she saw a shadow in my room, but didn't say anything at the time, instead mentioned it later. I then told her the first story in this post, and she said, That makes sense. Something has been with you for a while. She touched my hand and recoiled, and then left me without saying anything. We were friends for about two months altogether, and I haven't seen her since this. It was a month ago. I guess I'm asking if anyone has any information about this, or is it all experienced in the paranormal? I don't want to be rid of it. Frankly, it hasn't done anything evil to me. In fact, as far as I know, it hasn't done anything good either. These stories up here are just ideas. But this feeling I get is not a good one. It isn't dread or fear, just 
a little under neutral, just a little bad. Please help. Most days from 7th grade to senior year, when I walked home from school I'd cut through a park. It has a track around it which is just a 2 foot wide paved path, and on the other side there's a church and a funeral home, with their backs to the park, and on the other side it's just woods. It was January of my sophomore year, and we'd had a warm winter so no snow but plenty of rain. That made the little paved path so covered in puddles it was impossible not to splash, and the grass was so soggy it made a squelching noise when you walked on it. No matter the weather or time of day, there's always at least one person jogging or something. I was part way down the path when I heard footsteps, like a man wearing heavy boots and a dog collar jingling very close behind me. I moved to the side so they could pass me, but no one did. I turned around and there was no one behind me, no one as far as you could see in any direction, not even any cars in the church or funeral parking lots. I thought that was weird, but I kept walking. I heard them behind me again as soon as I started up, so I stopped and turned around and the footsteps and jingling stopped. When I continued walking, so did it. This happened a few more times and I was starting to get nervous and the fact that the person and dog were walking and didn't splash through any puddles was weirding me out. It was ankle deep water almost. They sounded so close too, like they were less than a foot behind me, the whole time. Oddly enough, I didn't hear the dog's footsteps, just its collar, but after maybe the fourth time, I stopped. It sounded like the person had come to a stop right behind me, then directly behind me, I heard a deep, low, unmistakable dog growl, which sounded like it was coming from maybe one and a half to two feet off the ground. Well, I didn't need to hear that twice, let me tell you, so I started running down the path, out the park, and the quarter of a mile home. I've never run so fast or run more than a few feet in my whole life, and I triple checked that the door was locked. I later realized that I'd first heard the man and dog when I was walking past the back of the funeral home. To this day, I'm unsure if that's of any significance. I've experienced weird things here and there throughout my life most of which with a perfectly good scientific explanation, I'm sure. And I'd love to share them all here, and maybe I will. But right now, I just want to share what happened over the past week, since it's fresh in my mind. So for some background info, I live in an old, renovated barn. I don't remember how old it is exactly, but I know it's pretty darn old. My grandmother and granddad believe the hill next to our house could be an Anglo-Saxon burial thingy, since out where we live is called the Low Bank Farm. And my mom said it meant something about Anglo-Saxons, but I don't really know a great deal about it. My grandparents moved here in the 60s with my mother. They had just lost their son the day after his 13th birthday. They distracted themselves by building this beautiful house which had always been a magical place for me, and isn't somewhere I've ever felt scared. My grandparents had lived here up until they died, which is when we moved in because we loved this house so much we couldn't bear to sell it, because of its sentimental value. I was going through a really rough time when we moved, but being here really lifted my spirits, and I felt like I had been healed just by being here. All of my grandparents have passed now, sadly. My granddad died in the house after a long battle with cancer, in the room that's now my sister's room. And my nanny died whilst on holiday. My other grandparents on my dad's side both passed away in their home, which we have now sold, with it just being a small bungalow in a housing estate. My grandpa, dad's side, was the last to go. He died while we were making our own renovations to the house so he could live with us here, so now his room is just used as a spare room. Moving on to the strange events 
of the past week. Me and my boyfriend were home alone while my dad was out doing something, so we were sitting in the kitchen eating breakfast when Patty, the cat, decided he was doing his daily mad one. He just runs around like an idiot. We have five cats. The two that caused trouble were outside, leaving the other three inside. Whilst Patty was doing his mad run, we had one other cat that sat at the table with us minding his own business, and another one who sat in the spare room having some food. Suddenly we hear this door bang, and I was like, eh, it's probably Patty batting the door being an idiot, so we kept eating. After a few minutes we heard, bang, 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 on the bathroom door. I grabbed a butter knife to defend myself with, and crept over. The door had been properly shut. I flung it open, and Patty came running out. After we laughed about it, we realized, how did he manage to shut the door behind himself? Because the building is old, we don't have knobs, but instead these latches that you need to lift up to open and shut the doors. And the doors open toward you, so in order to shut the door, he would have had to do the latch on the other side of the door, since none of the other cats or anyone could have pushed it shut. Weird. The next thing that happened was that my parents went away for the weekend. We were home alone, me, my boyfriend, and my sister. Me and my boyfriend were downstairs in the kitchen, again, and it was definitely only us because my sister has autism and won't leave her room unless completely necessary. I went to use the same bathroom that Patty had gotten stuck in previously. I was too lazy to shut the door fully because the hinge is hard to do on this door, so I could see through a small gap between the door and the wall while I was in there. Being the paranoid goof that I am, I was staring at the crack to make sure that my boyfriend wasn't going to jump out and scare me like he does sometimes. And I saw who I thought was him walk past the door to the right, quite swiftly. Before I came out, I called for him, because I knew that if he didn't answer it meant that he was going to try and scare me. But lo and behold, I heard him answer me from the kitchen, which was to the left. I hadn't seen anyone walk back toward the kitchen. So I was quite shaking up by this, while he laughed at me and tried to debunk it. This next one really got me. So it was quite stormy while my parents were gone, and I went to take the dog outside for a little run up the hill. When I opened the door, my little cat Lottie ran out. She doesn't like the cold weather and doesn't like to stay out for long, so I told her I'd let her back in when I came back, since I wasn't going to be gone long. Yes, I talk to my cats. Leave me alone. The hill I take my dog on is literally next to the house, so I was up there throwing the ball and keeping an eye out. After about ten minutes, I went back inside, and being the massive idiot and meanie I am, I forgot to call for Lottie, and it was getting more and more wild outside. I went upstairs and lay down to have a nap with my boyfriend when I remembered her. Because I was tired from going up and down the hill, I asked my boyfriend to go out and call for her. So he reluctantly stepped out of bed, then turned to me and went, Oh, she's here anyway, I don't need to. And before I could tell him that I let her out, that he was wrong, she just walked out from under the bed. My boyfriend didn't let her in, because he didn't even know that she was out there. And it's not like his lazy butt is gonna get out of a nice, warm, comfy bed unless he absolutely needs to. My neighbor, who we're really close to, hadn't let her in because I hadn't seen her leave her house or go over to ours for anything. I was so weirded out by this, and really want to be able to explain it. But every time I try, I can't. And neither can my boyfriend. There were other small things, too. Like the porch door opening when it was shut by the hinge, with a door stop in front of it. The kitchen light swinging backward and forward for no reason and my dog growling at something when she came into my room. Since my parents got back, though, things have seemed relatively normal again. Until now, when I've been typing this up, and I've seen things out of the corner of my eyes, and I'm getting a little scared because I'm alone and it's like... 2.09. I hope I'm just being paranoid. I have dabbled in witchcraft before, but nothing too deep. I've tried a spell or two, and am very interested in the topic, 
and I watch a heck of a lot of ghost videos and cryptid videos quite frequently. I've never felt like there was anything malicious in this house, since my grandparents were all such lovely people, and I've always felt safe here, so I hope I haven't let anything in by doing these things. Maybe I'm just overthinking it, but any advice or opinions would be much appreciated. Stay safe out there. When I was younger, I used to live in a condo. I had my own room while my parents' room was across from mine. Think of a T-shape with a room on either end of the top line. It would be relatively easy to see and hear someone in the other room. Now it was nighttime and I was asleep, but I woke up at what I assume was around midnight, or maybe a few hours past. I'm not exactly sure. Now, as a kid, I was never afraid of the dark per se, but wasn't too fond of it either. The thought of not being able to see what could be lurking close by, and being that vulnerable, always kind of freaked me out a bit. But I never believed in monsters in the closet or under the bed or anything like that. But I always just got creeped out by that dark something of which I've now grown out of mostly. And of course, being the kid I was, waking up that late at night when it was that dark out, I hid under the safety of my blankets. And that's when it happened. I was lying on my side still under the sheets, and I felt something poke me. It felt like someone just poked my side. That's it, nothing else, just that. Now I was a kid and it was late but it was a very significant and noticeable feeling. Of course, immediately I threw off my sheets the second I felt that, and to my surprise, no one was there. I thought it might be one of my parents who sometimes got up late at night checking on me to see if I was asleep, as as a kid, I liked staying up. I grabbed a late night snack from the fridge, ate that and went back to my room, pulling the covers over my head once more. And I even remember asking my parents the next day if they had come into my room and they both said, no. This story and the background surrounding it is going to sound mildly insane, but I ask that you please try to keep an open mind. Growing up, I've always been more spiritually in tune than what could be perceived as normal. As I've gotten older, that hasn't changed. I can go into so many stories about this, such as dreams I've had that came true, cases of sleep paralysis in which I've seen and felt things, an encounter with what I believe to be a demon, and so on. But for this post, I'm going to start off with my earliest and most prominent memory of living in a haunted house for a year and a half. I was 12 at the time. My family had moved into a house built in the 1930s, set up in a neighborhood of matching and equally old houses on a long, straight street. It was a fairly dark neighborhood with tall trees. Truth be told, it was almost a cliche horror setting. But being a sheltered Catholic girl, I didn't think of it that way. I was excited to live in this new house and make new friends. The first day in the house was relatively normal. The movers would arrive the next day with all of our respective furniture, so for that day we had our mattresses, some plates, utensils, and food. I wasn't really bothered by the house at first. Or maybe I was too blinded by excitement to really notice things. But this changed when night came. I went to my empty room where my mattress was, as well as a few personal items laid out, and started to make my bed. The layout of the room was fairly simple. My bed was right in the corner, with the doorway right across from it. My closet was on the wall my bed was pressed up to, so I could see its trim and outline from my bed, but not inside, if that makes any sense. The closet also had a door. For whatever reason, the closet bothered me, even on that first day. I can't explain it. I didn't even bother putting my clothes away, as I was too uncomfortable with it. But I also couldn't shut the closet door. 
I didn't want to go near it, even if it meant giving myself comfort by not having it open. Like I said, I can't explain it. It just gave me bad vibes. But being 12, I shrugged it off as a standard anxiety. You know, oh my god, closets are scary. Monsters under the bed. I figured the fear would go away. When bedtime neared, I realized that I had no lamps in my room, with the only light being from the overhead fan. The thought of being in there in total darkness left me with a terrible feeling. So I decided that I would sleep with my door open and the hallway light on. I didn't want my parents to assume I was being babyish, so I justified it in case I woke up and needed to go to the bathroom, get water, etc. I didn't know the layout of the house, and I didn't want to fumble around in the darkness to turn my light switch on. Parents understood, so great. At the time, I had a golden retriever who was the light of my life. She was my childhood dog who always slept in my room, usually on my floor or bed. When I was ready for bed, I took a treat and brought her in with me. I tried to get her to come to my mattress, encouraging her with words and food. But as soon as she entered my room, she whirled around and left. I tried to bring her in there with me several times, but only to have the same result. My mom said that the dog was probably just anxious due to the move, and I accepted that. So I tried to sleep alone. I couldn't sleep, though. I laid in my bed, bundled in my blankets. Coming from a conservative Catholic family, my brain never once jumped to the idea of ghosts or spooky things. I had no idea what I was feeling. But one thing was absolutely clear. Although I was alone, I didn't feel like I was. I glanced periodically at my closet door, noting how it felt as though someone was peering around the corner at me. I didn't see anything, but it felt as if something was there and it was watching me. I could only stare back before trying to fall asleep again, but sleeping in that room was impossible. After we received our furniture, I immediately set up a lamp on my desk at the end of the room that I would use as a nightlight. I refused to sleep in there in darkness. Bear in mind, I had outgrown sleeping with a nightlight by six, so being 12 years old and insisting my light be on for me to sleep warranted eye rolls for my parents. They thought I was being ridiculous, especially since I had no explanation as to why. How could I explain what I was feeling? I couldn't, because even I didn't understand. But they didn't argue with me. By night, I'd turn my lamp on, burrow myself in my blanket, and try to ignore that terrible feeling of being watched. I still didn't put any of my clothes in my closet. I kept them on my dresser, even if it didn't make sense for dresses, jackets, and so on. I put a Harry Potter poster on the door to make it friendlier, as if it were a protective barrier to provide comfort. I remember one night I was laying on my side, staring at the wall. I was curled and bundled as usual in my safe burrito form, only my face peeking out so I could breathe. For whatever reason, something compelled me to look up, so I did. In a slow, almost leisurely movement, I saw the shadow of what looked to be a person move across the wall. I didn't process it fully at the time. I tried to rationalize it in the moment as being the fan's shadow, but as an adult, I look back and shudder, recalling the distant features of a nose, a chin, and a hunched back. Another night, curled in my bed, I thought I saw movement at the end of it. A shadow, really, ducking downwards. I don't know what drove me to do this, honestly. Maybe twelve-year-old me was brave, or an idiot. But I pulled myself out of my burrito form and moved across my bed to peer down the end of it, as if I would see some person hunched there, or my dog, or anything. I saw nothing, of course. But the shadow was so distinct, and so dark, I knew something had been there. I curled back into my blankets, and tried to fall asleep. One other night, this time not in my room, 
I went to my parents' bedroom to retrieve some cough medicine from their cabinet, when I heard something so distinct that it gave me pause. There was a tap from inside the walls. This took me off guard, so I turned and looked to the wall where it was coming from. The tapping persisted, quiet and slow at first, but gradually beginning to build in sound. This may sound ridiculous, but I am willing to put my hand on a Bible and swear on my soul that I saw the walls move, as if something were pressing against it. It slithered up the wall and into the ceiling, as if trying to break out and as if the wall were made of softer substance. I began to sob and ran downstairs. My dad was away on a business trip, and my mom was asleep on the couch. She had taken NyQuil because we were both sick, so she was passed out cold. I tried to shake her awake, begging her to wake up, telling her I believed someone was upstairs. She didn't budge. I ran back upstairs to her room, and the horror persisted. I don't know what compelled me to do it, but I ran into my parents' bed and burrowed under the covers. I could have ran, but being in my room was no comfort, and I was afraid of every other room in the house. I stayed under the covers until the tapping stopped. Then I dragged my dog into my room with me and shut the door. She cried and whined the whole night, sometimes pawing to get out, but I was too afraid of being alone. I cried myself to sleep that night. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I've had to record these so many times now because I keep tripping up over my words, which I find really annoying as my narrations in this video had very few mistakes in them, which I was particularly proud of. But I suppose that's just the way it is. I hope you enjoyed this video. A huge thank you, of course, to Undead Storyteller for joining me in tonight's video. It really means a lot and I enjoyed listening to her narrations. I hope you guys did did too. I'm not going to edit this anymore. I've done it too many times. Hope you guys did too. If you did, don't forget that we have a video over on her channel featuring me. I narrate five stories over there. Um, I really suggest you check it out. Please do so. It's really good. And, uh, and yeah, I think she's an awesome content creator and you should definitely see what she's got. Really good stuff. I'm going to leave it here because the video is on screen now, so I'm just gonna wait for you to click it. Click, click the 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 video. It's right there, in the in the box. All right then. Stay awesome. Click the link, and I'll see you in the next one.